Eisenhower for President headquarters in Washington, D.C., the movement gains impetus as Senator Lodge of Massachusetts announces that Ike's in the New Hampshire primaries. He tells of past political discussions. During these discussions, he said specifically that his voting record was that of a Republican. He also pointed out that his political convictions coincided with enlightened Republican doctrine and that the family tradition was Republican. It is worth noting that in our conversations with General Eisenhower, he pointed out that he would never seek public office, but would consider a call to political service by the will of the party and the people to be the highest form of duty. I therefore authorize you, Governor Adams, to enter the name of Dwight Eisenhower in the primary election for the expression of the preference of the Republicans of the state of New Hampshire for President of the United States. At the General's headquarters outside Paris, he confirms Lodge's statement and says he'll accept a clear-cut call. But right now, his first concern is his present job, building Europe's defenses. It is on this task that he now reports. In this common effort, many advances have been made during the past year. Morale is definitely sturdier among civilians and armed services. In numbers, efficiency, and in spirit, the soldiers sailors and airmen of our allied force have been strengthened. With the news of Eisenhower's willingness to run, the Washington office from which the drive is directed grows busier as Eisenhower is definitely in the presidential race. Northern California digs out after the worst series of blizzards in 50 years. Roaring in from the Pacific, the storms have blanketed the countryside and halted all movement. Sometimes you have to dig for 10 feet to reach the roof of a car. With buildings nearly buried, the mailman's work becomes strenuous. Along one highway, a snow depth of almost 20 feet is measured. Below, almost hidden in the snow, lies the crack express train city of San Francisco, which stalled at Donner Pass, some 7,000 feet up in the high Sierras, while en route from Chicago to San Francisco. In Colfax, 34 miles away, nurses and other rescue workers board a relief train to go to the aid of the 222 passengers and crew members marooned on the snowbound streamliner. These scenes give an idea of the depth of the snow. The relief train finds the going tougher as it chugs higher in spite of a rotary plow in front to clear away. Donner Pass got its name, by the way, from a party of pioneers who were stopped here a hundred years ago by blizzards. There were no diesel trains to come to their rescue, and many perished from cold and starvation. Though nature has run wild here, snow is unnecessary, for they provide water that irrigate California's farmland. Six miles from the streamliner, heavy drifts force the relief train, whose forward section can be seen ahead, to stop. Provisions for the beleaguered passengers are loaded on army weasels, which, because of their caterpillar tread, can get across the snow to the stalled city of San Francisco. The weasel is an amphibious vehicle developed during the war and since found to have a variety of peacetime uses. Here is the city of San Francisco, hopelessly blocked by snowdrifts. Its sides festooned with icicles. It's been here three days with the passengers aboard. A news magazine cameraman is the first newsreel man there. For the last two days, the passengers have gone without heat. Sixty were overcome by gas fumes and are taken off on sled stretchers. But none suffered serious injuries, and they report that spirits were cheerful on the snowbound train. Then the monumental task of digging out the streamliner begins. Passengers are on their way home, but for two more days, the train lies embedded in its prison of snow. Now she moves. She's on her way. Man has won this particular skirmish in the unending battle with the forces of nature. The liner Queen Mary brings Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Great Britain, into New York Harbor for a series of vital talks with President Truman. Down the gangplank to a Coast Guard cutter strides Mr. Churchill. To Floyd Bennett Field, New York, an auto whisks the Prime Minister, who will proceed in President Truman's plane, the Independence, to Washington. At 77, he's still vigorous. In the 
Capitol, the reception includes full military honors. Mr. Churchill, whose main purpose is to develop cooperation between Britain and America in relations with communist countries, is greeted by President Truman, who agrees that peace is what both our countries strive for. The presidential yacht Williamsburg is the scene of some of the conferences. Churchill makes it plain that he seeks aid only for a common defense effort. Now the British statesman enters the capital for an address to a joint session of Congress, an honor rarely accorded foreigners. He speaks now of Europe's united defense effort. The sooner strong enough forces can be assembled in Europe under united command, the more effective will be the deterrence against a third world war. If I may say this, members of the Congress, be careful above all things, therefore, not to let go of the atomic weapon until you are sure, and more than sure, that other means of preserving peace are in your hands. Frenchman's Flat, Nevada, the atomic weapon of which Churchill spoke, is tested as a tactical weapon of war. A film badge goes on the rifle to show how much radiation it receives. Scientists want to learn the effect of atomic rays on military equipment. These dummies, likewise, are fitted with instruments to measure the radiation they undergo. Army trucks roll through the night, carrying into the bomb zone combat troops. The first, as these previously secret films reveal, ever to take part in atomic tests in the field. 5,000 hand-picked men move up in the cold dawn to take positions for the last of five atomic explosions. Generals William Keene, Joseph Swing, and Mark Clark watch the operation. Their troops are only seven miles from the point where the bomb is to be detonated. Nervously, the men await the blast. Tremendous detonation, felt 260 miles away, shakes the earth under the soldiers, and the blast fills the air with flying dust. The test is a terrifying experience, but it shows that the atom bomb can be used in support of troops. Above them, to a height of six miles, rises the atomic cloud. The test is successful. A new use for the bomb is developed, and a new weapon is added to our arsenal, one that will never be used, America hopes, but that will serve as a deterrent to aggression. Vegetables are the raw materials for Signor Luigi Livraghi's art. Signor Livraghi of Milan, Italy, uses potatoes, cabbage, eggplant, peppers, and celery to create odd and decorative sculpture. His deft fingers are at work now on a bird, which seems almost to come to life before your eyes. Here's one of his finished works, a swallow in flight. A ballerina made of vegetables pirouettes gracefully for you. And here's an elephant hoisting a log. A dancer and a bird are followed by still another ballerina. Next is a rooster whose every feather is made of vegetables. Two racehorses with their jockeys parade to the post. And here, the Raghi presents a whole aviary of birds. This cuckoo clock is a model for the sculptured cuckoo. But you'll never see any of these masterpieces in a museum. Mercilessly, they're tossed in the pot for supper, thus nourishing body as well as mind. <laughs> Lake, California, the Navy demonstrates a new and complex device for observing and recording the flight of guided missiles. Film is threaded into the mobile motion picture camera. The camera performs two functions. It is telescopic, bringing the missile photographed closer to the eye, and it slows down the missile's meteor-like flight. In the telescope tube of the camera, an officer sees his reflection on the parabolic mirror. 
The camera is called Little Bright Eyes because of these huge binoculars through which the operator follows the target. The camera is mounted on a mobile anti-aircraft gun turret. The operator, who must have high technical skill, takes his seat. Through the binoculars, he will follow the missile's flight, while his hands control the camera's movement. It can effectively film a missile at distances of from 1 to 20 miles. Now the target is spotted. It's a plane, a tiny speck off there, rather than a guided missile for security reasons. The operator follows it with his binoculars, and the camera's parabolic mirror swings round too. Here's the film from the Navy camera. The code marks on the right are made by an electronic counter which registers speed, distance, rate of climb, and other factors. The camera, exposing film five times as rapidly as our conventional camera, reduces the plane's flight to one-fifth its speed. The telescope magnifies the plane three miles away 22 times. A Navy invention advances development of our new weapons. The Revolutionary War was raging in America when England's Captain Cook discovered the Hawaiian archipelago, a tropic mountainous paradise of volcanic origin. It was a fertile territory swept by sun and gentle trade winds and surrounded by rolling seas. Today the United States knows the islands as one of its most valuable outposts, slightly more than 2,000 miles away, reached in nine hours by plane or a leisurely four and a half days by liner. The islands, comprising some 6,400 square miles, are the most important group of the Central Pacific. These sparkling shores were probably the last habitable area to be occupied by man. Centuries ago, setting out from Asia via Malaya, Java, and Tahiti, waves of adventurous Polynesian tribesmen landed in the Hawaiian Islands. They traveled in boats like these across thousands of miles of open sea. Cook, searching for new routes to the Orient, landed by accident at Waimea Bay in Kauai in 1778, thus ending 1,200 years of isolation. Cook called his discovery the Sandwich Islands. More explorers followed. The islands became an important point of call, but native life began to disintegrate under outside influence. Then King Kamehameha the Great unified the islands. In a decisive battle on Oahu, Kamehameha defeated his last enemies, driving most of them to their deaths over the Pali, where a modern highway now runs. The wars had wiped out the religions. Missionaries came, and Christianity began to spread rapidly through the islands. At the same time, under the direction of the New England businessmen, the natives began to plant sugar cane. The Hawaiian royal family lived in Iolani Palace, Last to reign was Queen Lilio Kalani, who wrote Aloha Oi, Hawaii's most famous song. In 1893, a revolutionary movement ended the Hawaiian monarchy. Thus passed royal power, for the islands were annexed by the United States in 1898. American influence is shown in the first houses built by missionaries, reminiscent of New England architecture. The missionaries also established the first print shop, where the Bible was printed in the native language. Today, the sugar industry, started by early settlers, forms the island's major source of income. Some 28 plantations, like this one on Kauai, produce 8 million tons of sugar cane a year. Pineapple is the second biggest industry. Once an exotic local fruit, it is now an important item on the American menu. Tourists form the third biggest business. Each year, some 50,000 visitors land in the islands where they receive a friendly welcome. The even temperature of the Hawaiian islands, cooled by currents from faraway Arctic seas, averages about 75 degrees, and riding a surfboard is as easy in January as in June. The island's capital is Honolulu, on the island of Oahu. The famed Aloha Tower dominates the city. The University of Hawaii, located here, has 20,000 students. Statehood is a burning question. 
A constitution is voted which would permit Hawaii to join the Union. And in some places, what may be our future 49th state looks like Texas or Montana. These cattle are grazing in the Rio Far West. Other parts of the islands betray their volcanic origin. A lighted match turns into steam, vapors escaping from vents running deep into the Earth's boiling center. You can hardly go out of sight of a volcano in the islands. While most of them are inactive, Mauna Loa on the island of Hawaii is very much alive. Mauna Loa, in fact, is the biggest and most active volcano in the world. Lava sands are the basis of several black beaches on the island of Hawaii. This is the start of a hukilau, a great fishing body in which the choicest varieties are caught for the big feast. a celebration in which everyone joins, and even the keikis, the children, can hula in the time-honored manner. In the history of the islands, this famed native dance has served as both a religion and a language. The luau is a traditional feast. A favorite dish is poi, made out of the root of the taro plant. Awe-inspiring beauty, natural wealth on land and in the seas, a deep sense of the past and of a new world to come. These are the things that distinguish Hawaii, America's front door on the Pacific. Seven days, the storm-crippled flying enterprise is towed towards port by the British tug Turmoil, whose mate Kenneth Dancy has joined Captain Henrik Kurt Carlson aboard the listing ship. When storms shattered the enterprise and heeled her over, Carlson ordered her abandoned. At the last minute, he decided to stay aboard alone to try to save her. The Turmoil, with an American destroyer standing by, tows her 300 miles towards port. Then, 80 miles from safety, new storms crash over the enterprise. The five-inch tow cable snaps. An engineer on the turmoil said later he wept when it happened. The gale goes on. Men aboard the destroyer try to send food to Carlson, who's been living on pound cake and warming his hands over a candle. Each attempt to tie on a new tow line ends in failure. The gale gets worse. The Enterprise, now only 41 miles from Falmouth, is going down. Carlson and Dancy are told a helicopter will fly out from England to pick them up. New winds force the plane back. The gallant ship is flat on her sides, and the heavy swell almost conceals her from the attending boats. A great mass of debris and deck cargo is washed into the sea. As the ocean poured over the superstructure, Carlson and Dancy leaped from the funnel. The turmoil picked them up after they'd been in the water for four minutes. Now the turmoil, the destroyer Keith, and the tug Englishman, chartered by the press, circle the ship in its last tragic moments. The turmoil wires its base that Captain Carlson and Dancy are safe and have gotten warm clothes and a shot of rum. Later, the Enterprise is 90% underwater. Her bow is almost straight up in the air, and then she begins to settle in 40 fathoms of angry sea, taking with her $2 million of cargo, steel, automobiles, antique furniture, objects of art, which can never be replaced. Ironically, the sea turns calm. The turmoil brings Carlson and Dancy to Falmouth, where the captain's Danish mother and father wait with a crowd of 10,000. Carlson and Dancy are greeted by the town's mayor councillor. Carlson apologizes for not bringing his ship home. With Dancy on the left, he tells how he slept on the slanted side of the cabin wall and prayed and read a book of maritime law to pass the hours. 
Then he's honored with a triumphal parade before he heads home to America. Landing at New York's Idlewild Airport, Carlson is greeted by his wife and daughters. A few weeks ago, he was just another sea captain. Today, thanks to his heroic effort to save his ship, he's an international hero. And New York City gives him a hero's welcome. A storm of paper, the mildest storm Carlson's faced, showers upon him on the ride up Lower Broadway as the city opens its heart. But the most touching welcome of all is that bestowed by Woodbridge, New Jersey, his hometown, which gives a neighborly parade to the 37-year-old Danish-born sea dog. The high school majorettes have never strutted so well before, and Carlson says the reception amazes him as he speaks at the municipal building. Really, I'm speechless. My boss sent me out a few months ago with a beautiful ship, and I come back with it, back without it. And yet, you all seem to be very, very happy and cheer me, and really, I'm amazed. I, I do not know what to say. I don't understand it all, but the warmth I felt here today in this township from all of you has more than thousandfold compensated for my little inconvenience out in the Atlantic the last three weeks. At home, Carlson refuses offers totaling thousands of dollars and says he'll go back to sea again.